History is filled with stories of life-changing decisions. These are some of my stories. This is Boyant Borgogi, reporting from Goyang, South Korea. Sup guys, welcome to Boyant Borgogi. This is episode number three. My name is Sean. Now today, we are going to talk about my story, how I got to this point, and kind of some of the big events leading up to my decision to go teach in South Korea. So like I mentioned in my first episode, I graduated from George Mason University in 2011 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Public Administration. Now, it took me about two years to get to this point. And it was, uh, it was a little bit of a difficult journey getting there. I spent about two years trying to get the ideal job with the government. Needless to say, the economy is not what it used to be. The job market is extremely competitive, especially in the government sector. And I couldn't really get anywhere. So I think I counted it up. I, I applied to well over 200 openings, some with multiple positions, no joke. And I'd say 80% to 90% of those were with the federal government, the rest were with local government. Let me tell you, I think I applied to every single agency and department in the government, from NASA to the U.S. Forest Service. So my goal was to become a program analyst or a intelligence analyst. I was hoping to work with the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, or the Department of Homeland Security. So let me tell you, I tried everything. I went to job fairs, I applied directly to openings posted online, I interviewed with current federal employees, I even went to some agencies and toured the office. I did like everything. I had my little contact list built up. I tell you, it was it was some of the most fun but discouraging points in my life. So after about a, a year of applying to these analyst positions, I started looking at other options. I wanted to stay local because Washington DC area has so many good jobs, I thought it was a good place to start. I started branching out after that and going for basically any position within the United States. I applied a job in California, Florida, um, all of the cool locations. So like I was saying, I went to a lot of these job fairs, and let me tell you, not a lot happens in these things. You talk to employers for about five minutes, they tell you, you know, check the website, apply online, oh, we don't have any positions right now, hmm, you don't look qualified, whatever. I will give you one thing about these job fairs, get the free stuff. I'm not kidding, there's a lot of free junk in these things. So here's something cool, went over to the uh, CIA's table and got a little optical mouse from them. Needless to say, I've never actually plugged this into my computer for some strange fear that there might be a tracking device or a bug or something in it. I did, however, let one of my friends plug it into their computer, and I haven't seen it since. That's like, I called the government snooping on its citizens way before this NSA thing blew up. Conspiracy theorist. So like I said, I applied to over 200 jobs in the government. I did not get one interview. So yeah, it was a bit discouraging. You know, you apply to a ton of jobs, you don't get one response. It's like, am I not good enough or something? Don't get me wrong. I wasn't the best student, but I had a good record. I had a good resume. I did a lot of good stuff. No, I didn't get some flashy internship in the middle of Washington, D.C. for summer, but hey, I knew what I was doing. And my degree equipped me to do a lot of good work I feel on the go. Well, I guess the U.S. lost a good employee. So while I continue to apply to all these positions within the government, I continue to work at my job in a local retail store that I had, you know, with my college job. Needless to say, it wasn't the best place to work. I did find out about Korea from a co-worker of mine. Uh, one of my jobs was training new people who came in, and he had just come back from teaching in South Korea, and he actually said, Sean, you should actually look into this position. I think your teaching style would be beneficial to that country. And uh, I didn't think much about it at the time. I was like, whatever, I don't, not really my thing. Uh, a few weeks go by and I saw an advertisement about teaching in Korea on a local job site for my school. I look at it and I instantly am very interested in all the uh, benefits that come along with teaching over there. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah.
it's free airfield. They will pay, most schools will pay for at least one leg of the journey. A lot of them will pay for both legs of the journey back and forth to your home country. Another thing, free housing. They will pay for the rent and provide you a, a fully furnished apartment or semi-furnished apartment in some cases to live in. All you have to take care of is utilities, basic living expenses, and of course, half of your health care. So starting around February of this year, I did a lot of research on South Korea. I, uh, I actually started collecting a lot of the documents I needed to collect in order to teach over there before I even found the position. In a later episode, I will go into detail about how to apply and what documents you need. For now, I'm just going to leave it with this. So as I did my research about South Korea, I found out that the main government program over there is EPIC, E-P-I-K, that stands for English Program in Korea. It's basically run by the Department of Education over there, and it's a program to get native English-speaking teachers into Korea to teach in public schools. That is the main hiring system for public school teachers in South Korea. You will be teaching alongside a co-teacher who will help you with translations and sometimes teach part of the lesson yourself. The other end of the spectrum is a hog one, which is basically a private after school business to teach a specific language or activity. Now a lot of these teach English. It is a business. They want the flashy English speaking teachers to come to their schools and basically that way they can get a lot more students in and make a lot of money. Now there are a lot of pros and cons of teaching in public schools in Hogwarts and I will spend an entire video discussing these later on. So I took four different avenues when applying for positions in Korea. The first one I did was I applied directly to EPIC, that's the public school system in Korea. So I applied in early February to teach with EPIC in hopes of getting a position for their September start, which is their fall semester. The next avenue I took was I applied directly to a recruiter for Hogwarts. Now I didn't want to teach at a Hogwarts, but I figured I would see what kind of offers I could get if I actually spoke with a recruiter. The third avenue I took was applying to a recruiter for public schools. They recruited not only for EPIC, but also for GEPIC. So a quick explanation, EPIC is all over Korea, that is public schools all over South Korea. Now GEPIC is the province directly surrounding Seoul. It is one of the larger provinces and therefore has a lot of schools. And finally, I applied directly to a private school. Now, the school I applied to was actually the position I got. Like I mentioned before, they are not a hard one. They function like a public school, but it is privately funded. Now, here's where things change a lot. Okay, so with the government here in the United States, I didn't get one in. When I applied to these positions in Korea, I applied to four positions, and I got four interviews. That's why. Right. Oh, it's amazing, I know. Now with the public school recruiter, I went through Corbio, which is probably the best and one of the biggest recruiters for public schools. They were pretty amazing. So I applied to them on a weekend, and by Monday they already emailed me back and said, do you have time for an interview that night? It was pretty epic. So I had my four interviews, but what ended up happening was, epic, I made it to the interview stage. I didn't pass the interview, which is pretty disappointing. But that opened a window for me to find the school I'm with now. If I had made it past the interview stage, I wouldn't be looking for other jobs in Korea, and I wouldn't have found this position. Let me tell you, this was a real blessing. Everything leading up to this point kind of was shaped, I feel, to make this possible. So for any of you out there who have big goals you feel that are impossible, let me tell you, don't ever give up. Keep trying. I've been through so much in terms of disappointment. Now with the Hogwarts recruiter, let me tell you, she was the nicest lady I've probably ever met. She had all this good information, she really liked that I was passionate about teaching. She even offered to be my Korean mother of sorts and help me out with every, anything I needed when I got over there. Super nice. So she actually ended up finding me a good Hogwarts to teach at in Seoul. So like I said, I didn't want to teach with a hard one, so I told her I couldn't accept at the moment, but I would keep her in the loop as to what was going on. So I ended up finding the private school I'm with now, and I had to say, I can't teach with your hard one. But she was gracious, and she said, still, if you have any questions, if anything's bugging you when you get over there, let me know and I can help you out. 
So that's my basic story in a nutshell. If you have specific questions, feel free to ask me and I will do some videos in the future about specific aspects like applying the document collection process and what applying to these different recruiters was like. So late next month I will be on my way over there and hopefully I'll be able to make a few videos in between. And uh, yeah, have a good one folks. Thanks for watching.